Hi, everyone. Welcome to the TimingResearch.com Crowd Forecast News, episode number 247 for December 2nd, 2019. We are recording this at 1 p.m. Eastern Time. And uh, my name is David Cosmeter. I'm the creator of TimingResearch.com. Today, we will be discussing the 323rd weekly report. So if you haven't had a chance to take a look at this yet, just go to timingresearch.com slash reports, and you can get either the uh, PDF or uh, web version there. Uh, today, um, I have arranged for Norman Hallett and Jim Kenny to be here. Uh, Neil Batho was also supposed to be here, but he had to cancel, so we'll, we'll try to have him back soon. And Jim will be moderating, so I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to Jim. Great. Thank you, David, and uh, great to be here, and great to have Norm with us again. Uh, this market has been very exciting in the first uh, few hours of uh, the return from the holiday, and uh, we'll get into what's going on and many other things as well. But before we get started, uh, uh, we have Norm Hallett, and uh, Norm's going to give us a little background on himself and also a little background on the company that he's running down there. Okay, thanks. Thanks, Jim. And uh, Neil must say, eat too much turkey. Yeah. He's eating too much turkey. I, um, as most of you may know out there, I'm, uh, uh, I'm known as the discipline trader. That's what the, the site is all about because we at the Discipline Trader concentrate on the mental and emotional issues of trading, help traders in that respect. And I, 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 there's no better time to have me on than during this holiday season when markets are a bit thinner and uh, things are, moves are a bit extended. I think we'll probably get into that a little bit later. But um, I, um, you know, I've, I've really enjoyed being in the business for the last uh, 30 plus years. And um, it wasn't always a good time uh, until when I met my wife, uh, she asked me why I carried so much emotion around with uh, with trading. When I had a good day, I uh, she, I was the best guy to get along with, and I didn't have a, when I had a bad day, you couldn't talk to me. I was quite not. I was a horrible person. Don't get me wrong. I was a nice guy, but uh, I you couldn't talk to me for a while until I cleared my head. So she could always tell whether I had a good or bad day. Well, she she being a subconscious trainer uh, really helped me out, and it took me literally a year before I would accept her help because you know traders, at least I am, <laughs> I'm, I'm a heady guy you know I we, we have a joke around the house that uh, I'm always right <laughs> so, and I'm not always right but the idea is that you got to break down the ego and I let her start to work with me from changing uh, changing the way I thought that started our whole business uh, about helping traders do what she did for me and, and so we've spent a couple of decades doing it so that's why I enjoy being on these shows and of course I can't help I have a math degree so I can't help but look at the numbers all the time and I'm a trader hey I, I like to take a risk and this is risk a risk business business, um, but you've got to take the right kind of risk. So uh, that's what we're about here. Yeah, uh, definitely getting over the mental uh, things that can hold you up. Uh, uh, you know, some people see something they should do, but whatever holds them back from doing it, uh, or they are onto something good and they can't stand it or something like that. So uh, the mental part of trading is just huge. And uh, it's a big thing that people should focus on, not just uh, the charts and the Fibonacci numbers and all that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. um, well, let's go into the questions that we do every week. And the first uh, question is always, Ways uh, the S and P between today's opening, which uh, looks like it opened at uh, what is it, 30, uh, 31 .43. Uh Where do we think we're going to close from today's opening of thirty one forty three and Friday's close? Well, by Friday's close, and I, I kind of have a two part answer here because it's speaking of Fibonacci, and I'll get into that later. Why? But uh, I think we're going lower. I think today I'm, there's a bit of a caveat that we need to close down here uh, 20, 25, 30 points lower in the S and P so that we get back into a particular trading upward uh, sloping trading range that we've been in. We're re-entering that now, and I think uh, you know, but judging by today's action and some of the things we're going to talk about later, uh, I think we're going lower. And uh, with regards to um, uh, some of the, uh, you know, your confidence level. How do you feel uh, the confidence level is? Well, I'm, I've got a very high confidence um, uh, for another nice leg down uh, before the end of the week. Um, and I have a, a lesser confidence about um, a little bit more downward action. So uh, I would have to say that um, um, a total downward action, I'm really in the 80%, 75%, 80% range here. Yeah. You know, my feeling is, is obviously, um, you don't want to step in front of a freight train. So uh, the first thing that had to happen was the, the market to stop making new highs. Now, the high last week was 31.54. Today's high is 31.43. So at least uh, right this second, it has stopped making new highs. And somebody could use 31.54 as a defensible point because
because if you don't have a defensible point, you know, obviously you're selling into the abyss or buying into the abyss type thing. So it's nice to see that the 3154 with the market at 3115, you know, looks fairly secure at this moment. Mm -hmm. um, but I was looking at the 10 day chart and there was a gap up uh, from 3110 to about 3120 last week. And that gap today just got filled when we went down to 3110. So I would think that not only like you're saying, it would be important to close on the weak side, but it also would be important to really try to get underneath this 3110 because there's not a coincidence why it stopped there today. It filled the gap there and now it seems to be supporting. So patience is a virtue when you're trying to get on the sell side of this thing because obviously it has uh, blown out a lot of people that have been negative on it uh, with uh, a run that just doesn't seem to end even though the earnings were just okay. The GDP is 2.1 which is okay uh, and like Jamie Dimon said in an interview it seems like the markets are discounting a very rosy future. So I would say, uh, you know, you're probably right that it, it it should be rolling over a bit, but it would be nice to have a day or two of price evidence that it can't take out 3154, you know? Mm -hmm. uh, Neil uh, just, with regards to Neil just, uh, uh, your reasoning, your guess, reasonings behind Burton, you know, uh, what uh, what's, what are you coming up with here? Jim, uh, that can makes you hear you me? Feel that, uh, yeah. Uh, Neil just sent me a message saying his uh, his prediction for the week is is uh, down 75%. So I just wanted to say. 75% on the S&P, it down to about 1,000 or 75%? confidence level yeah his confidence uh, yeah his uh... i'm only kidding yeah, yeah. <laughs> so he he's a believer that it, it that we finally broke the fever i mean this thing obviously yep. was in a fever pitch i mean you know when you go in uh, how many days in a row norm was it up you know that's not the way the world works generally uh, this is not money market you're in when you buy stocks and uh, it almost got to the point where you know it seemed like a risk-free investment for a while and that's just not the way the world uh, works on this stuff so maybe we're getting a break in the action uh, but uh, the reasonings behind uh, your feelings of that it could roll over, Norm. Where are we at on those? Well, um, you know, I, I've been fooled before. The last time I was on the show, I think I was fooled. In fact, most of the time, uh, as this as this particular upward movement, I'm, I'm looking at the last since October, and I'm seeing some, especially in the month of November, the bodies uh, on these candles are very, very small. The the distance between the open and the close are, are doji worthy or spinner worthy <laughs> uh, because. And, and, Can you and explain that, that a little bit? Because I'm not an expert on the candles and many people may not be. So okay. when the candles have that formation, which you say is a, a tighter formation, what's that telling you? Yeah, well, the, the, the important part, as the Japanese who invented all this, uh, the Japanese rice farmers, the, the, the open and the close are the most important parts of the trading day. It's, mm -hmm. where, it's where you've got to make a decision based on everything you thought through on the, at night. And, and then at the end of the day, you've got to live with it till the next morning. So uh, the, the, op the open open and the close is uh, are very important. Uh, now, that open and the close comprise the body of, of the of the candle, the candle being the price action uh, for that day, let's say, in a daily chart of trading. Of course, the candle or this um, that's comprised of the body and what they call the wicks. Now, wick, of course, uh, makes sense uh, to that nomenclature for, as we describe a candle. Uh, the wick are trades that occur outside of the open and the close, uh, outside of that body. So sometimes um, a, a, a doji is ex is where the um, market opens and closes at exactly the same price. So what you wind up having is a something that looks like a cross with the two wicks extending from the open and close line of the body being just a line when the open and close are, have equal pricing. That's that's called a uh, that's called a doji, and that's usually an indication of not non decision. It doesn't mean that the market is reversing. It just means there is a potential to, there is an equal potential to uh, reverse as to continue. So it's a non, um, it's a, a non-decision. Um, and uh, that same thing could mostly be said for a very small body where the market opens and closes at almost the same price. If you had a $10 range in gold and the open and close, if, if gold moved from uh, $1,200 to $1,210 in a trading day, I just picked two numbers out of the air, um, during during the trading day, but it opened at 12:03 and closed at 12:03.90. You've got a 90 cent body on a 10 10 dollar uh, candle, uh, the whole candle including the wick. So it's still mostly wicks, but you've got that small body again indecision, but not quite. The I hear what you're saying is there's not a lot of, of decision on it because then the candles would be bigger and they would have. Uh, 
maybe less wicks because of the fact that uh, it hasn't traded out of that range very much. You know what I mean? Absolutely. And usually a, a um, you'll see a series of, of larger candles, uh, the larger bodies. Uh, and we're not seeing that, you know, in, in meaningful moves. And we're not, and, and what I didn't mention is that I'm going to say red and green on a day that the, uh, the, the market closes below the open, that body is colored red. On a day where the market closes above the open, that body is green. And generally you'll see, you can only, it's like a picture talking to you. You see, if you see a lot of green bodies, it means that at least during the day, the market ended higher than, than, it, clo- than it opened. And that gives you a positive momentum that continues to carry from candle to candle. And I'm seeing that all the way up. If I count the last, uh, besides the last two days, today's trading and, and the trading on Friday, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, of the last 12 candles, uh, 10 of them are green. And, and I can go back to the next 10, look, and it looks like about the same ratio. So we're right. seeing interday positive feeling, but no no, no real strength. Uh, that's why it's important to look at your momentum indicators and look at volume, because sometimes the candles don't tell you everything. And, and strangely enough, they haven't given me much more information, except for to say what you've said in the beginning, that we continue to make new highs. That continues to keep people in the market. Right. Uh, that also lack of, tells- yeah, would you say it's a lack of seller environment more than it's a buyer, uh, heavy buying environment. Well, you know, there's nowhere to go um, with your money but stocks um, with, with this low interest rate environment worldwide. I mean, other countries are investing in our stock market because we're on the move. So you're always looking to buy. Everybody's looking to buy. They're looking for reasons to buy. When you look for reasons to buy, you usually find some reasons to buy until right. you get some overwhelming. Uh, the problem is it creates a lot of people that are just lulled into believing that the market will continue to go up not only day to day, but month to month and year to year. Now, of course, th- you can defend that argument with, uh, you know, the stock market uh, goes up an average of 17% a year for the last 10 years, whatever number you want to pull out. But the ride during that period of time can be treacherous. And um, and so, uh, you know, that's again where the emotions come in. And now that we're in the season, um, you're going to get thinner markets. Uh, you, you've got much thinner markets and you've got, um, and, and you've got a, a San- and you've got la- you've got the Santa Claus rally that makes people think we're going higher. But then you got last year where the Santa Claus rally really killed people, got a lot of people out of the bottom. And then right after Santa went back to the North Pole, the market had one of its best climbs in history. So, you know, these are, this is a very dangerous time to trade if you don't have a plan and you don't have discipline. It's an excellent time to trade if you have a, a, a good plan and the discipline to run it. So yeah, the, uh, the three things, you know, that uh, probably people should keep an eye on in addition to all the technicals is that, uh, you know, if this thing does stall out, uh, these managers who want to get a nice bonus, you know, they may want to grab some of the money off the table. And December 15th, it, <clears throat> right now, it looks pro- probable that uh, these December 15th uh, tariffs might go on and the Fed meets on December 11th. So, you know, you got three pretty big things going on in addition to the technicals. So it's understandable why people might not want to sell because the prices rise every day. But if they got any reason to sell, the exit and the volume that wants to come out into a no buy environment could cause a pretty sharp decline as well, right? Yes, and add the, um, in the recent several years, the last several years, uh, we've we've seen six, seven, eight, nine percent uh, pullbacks in the market, so that when, only to see it recover to new highs quickly in some cases. Right. And, and so, you know, that that's going to lend an excuse for people to continue to hold in a market that is tumbling. Yeah. And, um, and, and that may be... Um, yeah, I mean, if this market get dropped, there'd be a lot of people <clears throat> who would adopt the attitude of, hey, it's just a pullback, I'm not getting out. Hey, it's just a pullback, I'm not getting out. Because the moving averages are in a good position and, uh, you know, it, uh, the interest rates are in a good position and, uh, you know, the unemployment situation is a good position. And so there is a uh, huge complacency. I mean, just look at your VIX, that's all you really need to see. Uh, that complacency uh, is huge. Mm-hmm. But uh, if the VIX were to start breaking 14 or 15, well, it's about broken 14 today. If it started breaking 15 or 16, and and you started getting uh, 30, 70 or so on the S&P getting taken out, <clears throat> the story could change a little bit quickly. Huh? Yeah, and they would be right with all of the uh, all of the um, uh, justifications of holding uh, because there is nowhere to go and so on and so forth. But um, what I didn't like about today's 
today's action in the numbers right. uh, was, that, was that this time it was Europe and the rest of the world that looked had some pretty nice numbers and it was our manufacturing numbers right. uh, that, that, that were under some pressure. So that was a little bit different to me. And yeah. um, now, now if I look technically um, and, and I, I draw my Fibonacci numbers, if you, if you look at the last rally and you, you start your Fibonacci uh, retracements um, in the uh, third, I think third trading day of October, you use that bottom and then the recent top on Friday. Uh, and if you stretch your stretch that out on your Fibonacci there, uh, you're going to see that this particular, if this is a retracement that has any legs, uh, there really is a spot that um, that I, I th we've got a good chance to get to. And that spot is right, right in that 3000 to 3040 area. And I right. say that because that's, that's the recent double top we saw that was broken through. The, the, the exactly. Double top. I'm sorry. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Cause sometimes the market will come back to that breakout point, right? That's right. And, and this one was, um, uh, this one was the, right at the end of July. It was the first top. Mm -hmm. And then right in the middle of September was the second. You connect those two lines, you got a nice horizontal line right at that, um, 30, 30, 28 area. And, but right above it at 30, 41. So you're talking about 11 points from the S and P that's your first Fibonacci line. Now, anybody that, that uses Fibonacci knows that it's not an exact science. What you look for is deceleration and hesitation at these lines. And I would not be surprised to see the market hesitate going lower at that point because we're, we're now where now the resistance is now the support with the double top and right. we're at the 38.2% uh, uh, Fibonacci level. Now, if we break that, that's where I had my high, um, that's where I had my, and, and the, since the markets fall faster than they rise, uh, we could see a full month of, uh, of, of profit taking this week. Um, th that's why I have a high confidence in the, in that move to test the highs. The lesser confidence, and it won't happen this week, is retracement of this entire recent rally, which is at the uh, 2850 area. Um, again, um, there are a couple of Fibonacci points in between that are worth noting, but there doesn't seem much to be much in the way of other confirmation. Like I just mentioned, a double high. I like, you know, there's a gal, uh, her name is um, Carolyn, Bar Carolyn Baroden. Heard that name, yeah. She, I, when I, I had a show years ago uh, in the 90s, it was called Risky Business, and it was all about futures market. It was an hour a day on radio, and uh, five days a week. <clears throat> and uh, she, was one, she was one of my favorite people to interview. She, she talks about something called um, something called, not confluence, but uh, synchronicity. That's the name. That was the name of her newsletter. So, and and she she's got a very high percentage um, being right. So I've always listened to her. Uh, she looks for two or three technical reasons to believe something. Just because something is rolling over and breaking a trend line, that's not good enough for her. She wants right. to see it, you know, uh, hitting on a uh, hitting on a resistance area at the same time. She wants to see some Fibonacci numbers. And when she gets three synch synchronistic indicators. She she really feels good about it, and and that's when her recommendations come out. So she's really a high probability trader, and that's possibly what we're looking at here. Where you know there's an uptrend line that was broken today, the simple uptrend line. Um, you talk about lack of new highs. It's another. I'm not going to call it minor because that that seems to be a major thing lately. Uh, and then um, you know if we see some uh, some action on the downward side, we could have that third uh, testing of the uh, of the support. So I, I like what we're seeing here uh, without even talking about momentum, which is yeah. One other thing is the debt market seemed to be unstable here today a bit in that I think the factory manufacturing uh, uh, concerns uh, puts into play the concerns that this debt that has just exploded on the market on the corporate level, that the covenant and the collateral on them could come into question because if we have any type of a settling down of mm -hmm. the economy, uh, the debt service could be problematic for some of these companies, particularly in this triple B space, which is mm -hmm. the most crowded space. And mm -hmm. it's only it's also the last stop before uh, non-investment grade. So if triple B's one level down, it would cause the funds that have to be in investment grade to have to liquidate them. And so that's been a risk for a long time, but risks that have been a long time sometimes obviously happen. You know what I mean? No, absolutely. And I, you know, the, uh, most traders that have been around and look, look for a little bit, um, you know, we, we've, uh, it was a surprise move. It's still a surprise move, this, uh, what's going on uh, today in the, in the bonds. Um, and, um, and of course, we're seeing a rally in, in uh, 
just because of those positive uh, European numbers, we're seeing a big rally in the um, in the euro dollar, in the euro, and we're also seeing a rally in, in the complementary currencies. Uh, anybody that's been following me knows that I've been watching uh, religiously the Japanese yen. I think we talked about that last time, and uh, yeah. I've advised that people keep their eye on it. And if they're going to probe, probe on the long side with it, because we're looking at a double top or double bottom that we've punctured through. And we'll talk about it a little bit more, but a little bit more maybe later. But the but, but the currencies are you know are giving us a kind of a window as the, that you've just described. Yeah, I have a 10-day graph up on the uh, U.S. dollar, and I see it rolling over pretty sharply. I have a 10-day graph up on HYG and TLT. One is the Treasury, the other one is High Yield Corporate. They look on the 10-year graph that they're rolled over pretty good. And so, and the U.S. dollar, of course, uh, and the S&P is now rolling over pretty good. So there has been a little bit of a get out of Dodge here um, on the 10-day graphs anyway, uh, showing that the bloom came off the rose just a little bit in all those markets I just mentioned. Yeah, and, and I think if everybody cares to take a look at a dollar index daily chart, uh, they're going to see that we had what could be considered a, um, a shooting star in Friday's trading, where we actually went high, made new weekly highs, uh, and then uh, then collapsed and, and closed on the low of the day, causing that uh, that shooting star formation, followed by the follow through today on the downside. All of that, all of that action matches a top that occurred about 10 days ago. So we've we've got a double, t a minor double top uh, breakthrough of uh, some of the um, most moving averages that anybody's going to chart that has any kind of short term ilk to it. Uh, I, I now the short term moving averages they've had to have broken the 50 day broke uh, today because that's at I have it at 98.22. And the 200 days at 93, so still above the 200 day, but under the 50. So yeah. that's why you know the first stages of a potential turn are starting to happen. Whether there's going to be follow through or not, probably has a lot to do with this December 15 tariff. What the Fed does on December 11, and that that is days away. Mm -hmm. And we're also seeing uh, you know decreasing momentum here, according to the RSI. And there, are, I won't uh, you know you know I'm a big fan of Hema's work, and uh, th there's a number of uh, different time frames that are that are showing you know weakness. Uh, in in, uh, in the dollar index, so uh, you know that's going to that, that of course will translate for the most part into strength in the um, in all the all the all the other foreign currencies measured against the dollar. But of course um, there are there are specific situations that even have even more control. But um, it's going to be helpful to all the foreign currencies on the northern northern side for sure. Yeah, and I think uh, Neil, uh, who's not with us today, but uh, did come in with his uh, his guess that we are going to roll over to the downside this week and his probability. So high is probably also linked in part to that uh, Japanese candlesticks uh, because I know he watches those as well. Well, and also I think if you just look at the size of the candles, uh, just today's, um, you know, the, the red candles, as, as we all, we know that the, the, there's a saying markets move uh, move down faster than they move up. But but I think that's 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 a justified expression when you look at the at the size of the daily movements when you get disappointment in a market. Um, yeah. I think largely there's a a lot of ego tied to trading, and I think that you know when you're when you're pushing some positive vibes on yourself, you're you're seeing the market go up. But when you're wrong, uh, that's when some uh, you know people tend to bail and cause these these exaggerated moves, uh, which could be part of it, especially during thinner markets. So I think this could be a preview to be very careful in the markets. And I'm not saying don't trade them. I'm not, I'm a guy that likes to trade during yeah. this period, but but I do think that so you know, yeah. From time to time, the uh, I'm an option guy, so from time to time, the uh, covered right or the collar strategy, you know, can come in quite handy. A stock like Apple went up to almost 270 and the 200 day moving average uh, was down at around 200. So it was about 30% above its 200 day moving average. And that's a very decent extension over its 200 day average. And if you go 10 or 15 bucks out of the money and get a decent premium and then take that premium and buy some put insurance or just take the premium in, you know, that could be a decent uh, a situation on a short term basis because, uh, you know, like I say, some of these things have have really gone on big runs. Um, and some people are saying the retail stocks, uh, you know, also have had uh, quite a big run and they uh, they may be indicating a little bit of a temporary slowdown as well. Which brings up a question for you. I, I, as you know, I have a back a bit of a background in options, but uh, not really, uh, I don't get into complicated strategies. Uh, I mostly advise people to write covered calls and uh, yeah. and do some things, maybe some straddles. But uh, in a market like this, when, when you're looking to um, take advantage of selling the dollar or 
um, selling the bonds or, or, you know, when you have these, or buying some of these currencies like the euro dollar, when you have yeah. these strong moves, um, you've got the increase in premium that, that's all, almost automatic. Where, where does somebody who believes we were maybe one third of the move into the move, what's the best way to approach buying premium or, or do you need to do combinations in order? Uh, well, I mean, to- you know, obviously when the premiums are relatively high, the way you try to neutralize higher premium is through the uh, spreading device where you're going to sell a option out of the money to offset the cost of the one you bought underneath. Now, what does that do? It does reduce your cost out of pocket, but it also caps your gain to the difference between the two strike prices, less your total cost of the option. Mm -hmm. So the bottom line is, is that the standard way of uh, approaching a high premium uh, market is to, uh, to use the spread. Um, Because obviously, you know, if the premium is big enough, it could be discounting most of the move you're planning on seeing anyway. So the market could go your way. You still lose money because the premium decay will kill you. So uh, there's also credit put spreads that people consider underneath the market, where they're, again, they're only going to have a fixed gain, uh, but they're going to have a fixed risk between the two strike prices, again, uh, and with the credit uh, coming off of that. Um, so there's a couple of different ways to do it. Credit put spreads or credit call spreads, you know, are some of them, um, you know, that people investigate. But, you know, everyone has their own motivation and you have to find out the strategy that's right for you. But my personal opinion is when the premiums are high, you know, you got to look into the spread market. Yeah. What about... Or, or you have to be in some uh, parabolic move where it doesn't matter what you pay for the option. They're, it's going way faster than volatility can keep up with, you know. Is there a... You said, you know, people have their different reasons for doing it. Is there a calendar spread type choice? Yeah, like I said, that's another way. But then again, uh, you know, you'll, you'll have one fighting against the other. So right. it's, you know, there's always a, a give for a take, you know what I mean? Right. So, uh, you know, a calendar is another way where you take a long-term position, uh, maybe on the long side, and then basically you sell shorter-term options to try to off co- offset that cost um, on the um, on the shorter-term options. I mean, if somebody so, yes, wanted to go, if calendar somebody... spreads is another way to go, and under certain circumstances, they could be a better way to go. Yeah, I, I've always enjoyed. If somebody wanted to to uh, look to find a place to sell the S and P, whether it's being a partial uh, hedge on what they have in their IRAs or whatever, uh, but they're looking to short the market. You you had a you had the initial uh, wave down where the market where the S&P was 30 plus. Now we've had a little bit of a rally. Where is where? I mean, is there a timing thing with that you look at looking at options all day long where you're looking for a premium break so that you can get in? Is there does it happen within an hour? I mean, obviously, you know, when I'm seeing 11 on the VIX and I'm looking at the all time high on the market and I think that it could have uh, trouble up in this general region, obviously the puts are looking like a good buy to me. Now today, obviously they're good buy because why? We got almost a 20% jump in the VIX and I'm sure the short-term puts are exploding. So obviously it's kind of like, you know, a profiling, you know, uh, certain situations uh, fit a profile and the profile, uh, you know, in this particular case in the last week is, you know, you're, you busted above 3,100 to 3,150. Uh, you uh, have got a lot of news coming up that may not break your way. Even if the news does break uh, a good way, how much has already been discounted? Right. And when your VIX gets down to 11 and the premiums get very, very low, obviously, you know, either doing a straddle, a strangle. So if you're wrong, maybe you'll break out the other way mm-hmm. and the volatility could be enough to cover both of them or just doing outright uh, put hedges against stock or like I was talking about uh, writing the out of the money call which should be pretty fat because the call you know call should be up pretty good and then taking that to buy insurance puts underneath and bracketing your equity mm-hmm. you know these are the things that come to my mind very quickly because I've been doing it for decades yeah you sound like an episode of the, the Irishman uh, the straddles and the strangles <laughs> I didn't I didn't see that yet but I understand they did some camera work to make Robert De Niro and Al Pacino look like young men. I'm going to ask them to send that over to me. You better have time on your hands. I think it's a three hour. I think I, I binged it for three hours or something. It's long. It's a long time. I didn't see it. Yeah. Hey, listen, uh, we're at halftime of the show almost, and we haven't gotten into some of the stuff that you um, uh, focus on. And again, as far as the options are concerned and my uh, knowledge on them, my first thing I always recommend to everybody is talk to their broker, talk to their brokerage firm, learn as much about the strategies as possible, and then ask them if they 
think they're suitable for them. And if everything's a go, then go ahead and enjoy yourself. Uh, but uh, do investigate the different strategies and definitely talk to your broker and advisor to find out which, which uh, might or may not be suitable for you. Don't just jump into anything uh, because you hear something on TV or the internet. Um, all right. Now, we are talking uh, up in uh, Norman's Alley. We're going to call it Norman's Alley, and uh, it's going to be in the currency area because I think uh, it looks like something might be occurring as far as the U.S. dollar. And is there going to be follow through or not? Nobody knows for sure. But uh, I'm punching up uh, the currencies right now, and we're going to start taking a look at uh, how that U.S. dollar is shaping up today, which uh, for the foreign currency guys who are bullish, uh, some of them are doing all right here today. So uh, Japanese yen, 91.76, something like that, Noah? Yeah, correct. I have uh, I have it at 91.78 and a half right now. 78 and a half. Okay, so it's a little bit uh, different. Yeah, it's up to um, 20. I'm, I'm looking at the futures contract. You're looking at the Forex? Yeah, probably. It's only a couple of ticks different, <laughs> yeah, nothing to write home about. Um, as far as uh, that market right now, uh, what's your gut feelings? Yeah, on what I you think if, if somebody could uh, just take out uh, take out your uh, daily chart, it's pretty easy to see what's happening. And we haven't had any kind of breakout yet. Um, we've uh, we keep making more. I mean, this this is a definite downtrend. Uh, we, we have lower lows and lower highs the entire way. Um, if you pull if you pull back into a weekly and monthly chart, we've just broken a, a, a double bottom way back when. So this is where I start to uh, look for uh, these kinds of rallies. Now, the, the fact that the dollar index has come down nice and hard, and if it continues, you may get that rally here. If you connect, the, I said higher highs and, I'm sorry, lower lower highs and lower lows. If you take the high from, uh, I believe it's the 26th of, uh, of August, and, and, you, uh, and you connect that with the high uh, on the fourth trading day of October, you, you make that line, that trend line down, and you're seeing that we've, we've kept within, except for one break that failed quickly um, uh, last week, early last week. The uh, and then if you take, uh, if you're looking at the lower lows, you take the low uh, on, it looks like the 13th of August, and you connect that with the low in the middle of September, you'll see it on your chart. Um, we're, and it won't extend the whole way. I don't know what charting system you use, but uh, that bottom line is not going to extend much because we've been riding the top part of that funnel now for the last uh, last month. Today, we've broken through again with today's action. We've broken through that, that channel. Now, it's, it's not something you need to jump on right now. Uh, but if you look at some of the recent supports uh, that uh, resistances that can come su become supports, this is a market I like because it's giving me numbers that I can I can plan on, I can go with. And in, in the way I trade, I like to have targets and I like to have resistance areas where I can where I can put my stop. Um, and that's what we're entering here. So I, I think if any anybody with their chart with any kind of chart worthiness, I think you, you'll you'll find some some nice lines to draw um, to give you some uh, some some measures on the way up. Uh, the last measure being about 92 uh, the 92.800 area, where if we break through that, then we're we're in more rarefied air um, on the way up. So this is the market that I'm watching, and what I really like about the, the market is that we've been riding in an area uh, that HEMA likes to call the bull support area, even though we've we've seen this market come all the way down. Um, so I I, I I like the change in momentum. We're starting to see, as I mentioned, I put my position on a couple of weeks ago, and I've been holding a very small, uh, a very small loss up till now. I've gained back half of that loss to, in today's action, and look to be profitable by the end of the week, and, and start to add positions as we break through some of these um, these lines. My lines, my resistant lines, come to ninety one eight seven four. Then again at uh, ninety two four forty eight. Those are lines that I've drawn, uh, and again the one I mentioned. 92807. Um, those those are critical areas that I see. Um, you know, we could start have some stutter stutter steps, but it's all going to be around uh, the break the broken out area. In other words, we've broken today this downtrend according to uh, the lines that I've given you. Uh, and so I'm, uh, I'm 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 I like I like the setup, and this is the kind of trading that I like to do. If I can add positions on the way up as we confirm, uh, then you can usually really have some nice results. Yeah, and uh, that uh, little bit of 
of a dip uh, could just be running stops. And sometimes after they run the stops, it goes the other way for a while, right? Excellent. Yes. And we talked about uh, spinners before and dojis where you have a small fr Friday's action, although it was pretty heavy in a lot of markets, was a very small trading range in the um, in, in the Japanese yen, even though it was a positive day, which was unlike the previous six trading days, um, kind of gave us hope. Today's extended move, uh, breaking that channel uh, may give some, uh, at least a few Japanese traders I know, uh, some some cause to look to the northern side. So I, I like the I like the action today. Yeah, you know uh, the other way of obviously you're starting out to try to get something near the low, and then once you get confirmation, add to it, which is certainly a legitimate uh, strategy. Another one would be to kind of wait for confirmation uh, momentum, mm -hmm. and there seems to be um, some levels on the British pound at 130. Yeah. And and uh, on the euro, maybe about 111 or so, and on the Japanese yen, about 93. And mm -hmm. if they can break those levels, uh, then you might see short covering, positioning increase quite a bit. You know what I mean? Yeah, and if we had Jody Samuels sitting here with uh, with her um, um, her Elliott wave, she would tell you to wait for a pullback uh, on this. And, and the pullbacks can happen at any of those junctures that I talked about on my chart that you can draw right. on any chart. So, um, you know, if you're looking for a place to get in, uh, uh, sometimes those pullbacks. The problem is, again, it becomes it becomes a discipline thing because in your mind, when it's pulling back, you, you, part of your mind is saying, "Hey, this thing's pulling back and may may not be going. It looks like it's reversing." You know, you start talking yourself into hesitating. So you need to make your plan and draw your lines before. I've had these lines drawn for a month now. Some, most of these, at least a few, several weeks on the latest ones. You, you've got to you've got to have your plan in place, and uh, you know you want to do what the market tells you to do. But you want to, if you can, at least the way I trade, you want to try to anticipate what you believe is going on based on uh, the indicators that you're having, that you have, and and the experience that you have in, in knowing what happens to markets. That, that mar not all markets go, all markets don't go straight up or straight down. That you're looking for things to meet your uh, your analysis, and um, you start off light because you'll mostly be wrong uh, when you're when you're looking into the future like this. But when you're right, you're going to have a you're going to have a nice roadmap to go on with a, with a lot of credibility along the way because you've planned. So really it's a matter of, uh, of mental juxtapositioning here to, to do what I've suggested that you may want to do in the Japanese yen. Yeah. The um, other thing that uh, people uh, look at um, is the price of gold and silver, but let's just talk about gold. Uh, um, you know, had the big run up to 1580, which was uh, pretty much the former lows around 12, uh, 2012, and it had resistance there and it got way overbought. So obviously it had to, you know, digest that pullback, which it's in the process of continuing to do. Uh, my gut feeling was 1450, 1400, and 1350 would be three levels to keep an eye on if you're still a believer mm -hmm. that the gold has a future to it. You know, and again, with the world's paper currencies and the amount of debt that these guys are issuing as if it's just an unlimited, uh, you know, amount of debt that you can uh, think, you would have to think the paper currency and the debt explosion, you know, has to have something, some effect at some point um, that might be positive to the gold. Do you see levels in gold? Do you think gold does have a future? And do you think there's some levels that are interesting? Well, isn't that the question? I mean, right yes. now we're riding in, in HEMA's area of a, a gold support area. And, and the market is showing, you know, it's showing weakness, but not not in any kind of an extravagant way. It looks like the absolute area needs to hold is 1400, looking at that accumulation back uh, in the July, August area. But the accumulation that you're talking about right now, that first level that you're talking about, 1460, if we don't hold that, we should see 1400, uh, according to what I'm looking at here. Yeah. Uh, and, um, you know, then, you know, a break of that, and we could go all the way back to, you know, the, the 1200 type of area. But, yeah, but, so that, know, well, in that case, the party's over. The bottom was, line I, is, I, if, the, I, if we got a 1700 number in our future, like Tudor Jones has touted, um, going back to 1200 or 1280 seems awfully generous for the bulls to be able to pick up something that's going to go back to 1700. So, you know, if you broke 1450, 1400, and 1350, which is the three breakout point kind of thing, then uh, I think it would put the whole thing in. I think the deflationary story would have to be going through the roof at that point. Yeah, yeah. I mean, of all those, there's a lot of this, but yeah, I mean, what what, ha what, you ta what we're talking about here is that, I mean, you've got to be disappointed with today's move in gold if you're a bull. I mean, you would think that with the market down, uh, you know, 25, 30 points in the S&P that you've seen gold, you know, up a good uh, 8, 10, 12 dollars. Uh, yeah. But, you know, it can't get out of its own way today, down about two and a half right now. And I, you know, 
uh, and we're only challenging a very minor key about uh, twelve, thirteen dollars away uh, yeah. for resistance. So I, you know, I'm uh, it's a it's a disappointing uh, action today. Uh, but you know, in in the end, you know, you're gonna watch it because disappointing action can fulfill itself very quickly. Uh, I guess it's because of the manufacturing uh, area. But yeah, I, I mean, the manufacturing slow. So slow sounds more like recession, and recession okay. sounds more like deflation. And of course, that's uh, not the greatest. But uh, the mining shares, GDX and uh, and some of the other uh, proxies for the mining shares are still holding their 200-day moving average, which I think is encouraging. And uh, holding this 1450 area is encouraging. Um, and the fact that they continue to uh, run deficits of $134 billion in October is encouraging. And the fact that it seems like they would print unlimited money uh, if they had to keep this thing going is encouraging. So there's some things that are encouraging, but I definitely, you know, this you always lose your enthusiasm when you have a correction. So at 1580, you think the world is fantastic. And at 1450, you're starting to think that your team sank. You know, so the bottom line is, you, you know, talking about emotions, you know, you have to control those emotions and uh, come up with a game plan that you believe in and obviously you take risk with. Yeah, I've got a question for you because you're, um, and I probably should ask you this personally, but I might as well ask it with the crowd listening because I'm going to sound like I'm not on top of it. But I know you, you're, you're, some guys have their thing and uh, I, I, you know the Chinese there were there was talk I stopped hearing the talk about four or five years ago was buying up all our paper and kind of keeping everything afloat and the risk was that what if they decided to sell all those all that paper all at once it could crash our economy is there any truth to any of that and should I be worried about that with all the debt well obviously I don't know for sure you don't know for sure so we have an opinion we have a guess right and so, uh, you know, my opinion is, is that they have already been selling off the treasuries from what I've read. And I don't know that the amount of treasuries they have are that tremendous. And I also think the Fed would print and buy, and buy it back themselves because that's the deal now. Print money and buy your own securities back. That's what they do all around the world, right? right. So bottom line is, is I don't think that's as much of an issue. But I do think the issue is, is the Chinese have been supposedly buying quite a bit of gold and central banks have been buying a lot of gold. And I think that they are becoming more and more concerned because of how aggressive we have been about America first to have the U.S. dollar as the reserve currency, because that makes them very much hostage to the U.S. And if they could find another settlement means that they could live with, I think they would go with it. And my case in point there is that the European governor uh, made a big speech in Jackson Hole about digital currency, and the Chinese are embracing blockchain uh, technology. And so I think, you know, our days of holding the world hostage to the U.S. dollar as a settlement is not getting... Uh, uh, is not getting further away from change. It's getting closer to possible change. Well, and and I people, think I'm sorry. that's what I think. Yeah, listen, for those that don't understand or don't, uh, new, the newer traders that may not understand what he's talking about holding hostage, in order for any, anybody, uh, any country to buy oil, you've got to first convert your currency into U.S. dollars because U.S. dollars is the is what's accepted in the oil market. So uh, that's a demand on oil that I've seen up as much as, you know, 25 and 30 percent on the on the total demand of the U.S. dollar and how true that is. But uh, it, it, suffice it to say, it's a big chunk. And all, if all of a sudden um, uh, oil could be sold on, in any currency and it didn't need the U.S. to buy the U.S. dollar in order to convert that to uh, to, to petrodollars, uh, then, uh, you know, that could really hurt the U.S. dollar. So it's being propped up to some degree, the U.S. dollar, by its, um, its, its positioning as far as the oil market is concerned. So I think that's what you were getting. At. Yeah, that and you give another example. You know, um, uh, the Saudis used to uh, basically control our existence on oil, and now shale and other uh, domestic producing has changed that. And it's not coincidental. Now they're willing to sell the company. So, you know, I don't think they're selling Aramco because they're nice guys. They're selling Aramco because they can see that the way these trends are going, what they own, what they do, uh, might not be as popular in five or 10 or 20 years. And they'd rather get two trillion now than maybe, uh, you know, a half a trillion if the thing goes electric or something. You know what I mean? Right, right. Mm -hmm. In other words, you know, when they're coming to market, you know, and some of these uh, new offerings you've seen, they come out at 80 bucks and they're at 20 bucks before you know it. So, you know, people coming public is not uh, always evidence uh, that it's a great time for the company. It might be sometimes a way for executives to unload their equity to the unsuspecting public who's getting caught up in a bunch of uh, greed.
agreed. Right, right. But uh, well, uh, again, so you think the gold, uh, you know, is still uh, dodgy here, uh, but um, you know, it's not. Uh, you you're not a, a table slamming bear or bull at this point, right? No, no. I think the jury is way out on it. I mean, if you look at the, uh, if you look at a February gold chart, daily chart, you're going to see um, a downward. Um, you're going to see a nice flattish downward trend. Not a, not a, not not any kind of, not much of an angle. And uh, if if this is going to be a gigantic flag, and it's very formidable, the length of time. Uh, you know, that's really, we used to take a protractor when we were using the charts on the paper and you start mm -hmm. at that, you, you start at where the, the trend began and you, and then when it breaks out, you take your protractor and you see, and you, you set your targets. Uh, and the longer this pro, protracted move come, goes on, I you like that plan of words, uh, the, the more, uh, the, the bigger this move will be. So there, there's going, the bulls are going to look at that, at this accumulation. Uh, it's, and it's, an, you know, the, the, the distance from the top to where we are right now is a hundred dollars. Yeah, so it's, it's not like we've crashed over the last three, four, or five months. You know. No, I, I, like I say, uh, the 200-day moving average on gold is still intact, and the 200-day moving average on some of the gold stock proxies are still intact. So to throw it out the window with the bathwater, I just think is premature. But uh, like you're saying, if deterioration turns into rotting, then you've got a different situation. Right now, I would describe it as deterioration and correction rather than rotting and the party's over. Right. I think the evidence that I'm looking at leans me that way. Now, obviously, it could change any time. Let's look at a couple of other markets before we sign off. And one is in the crude oil, which uh, you know obviously has been in the 60, 50, 60, 50 range. Uh, and uh, Today it's up, um, but uh, do you have a gut feeling uh, that it might be on its way anywhere uh, special here uh, at the 55, 56 area? I mean, are we going to take out 60 and go higher, or, or are we stuck here for the foreseeable future? Uh, you know, there's a. I wish I could help you in there. I mean, we're, we're selling the market when it when it approaches the 60 area, um, and uh, and and buying it around the 50 area has made a lot of people a lot of money lately in the last uh, in the last few months and and uh, last few months all the way back to June. Uh, and, you know, we seem to be very comfortable here in this area. Yeah, so, it really does. Yeah. You know, so, and, and the, the length of, of the, um, I think we're going lower in the short term because we're we're, past, we're, we're above the midpoint and, and but we've done it in an aggressive fashion. Again, a spinner followed by a decisive spinner on, on a Thursday, followed by a decisive down move uh, today, uh, really shows indecision and then everybody deciding the same thing. And that's, an, that's down um, uh, th that that was critical on Friday. Today we're seeing a response to that. Uh, we, we were much higher uh, earlier today than we are, and if we take out today's low, I think we're going to shoot for that 50, 54 first, and then the 52 area. So, I think there's an OPEC meeting this week or next as well, and that could be a factor on how things come out because they're saying that Saudi has excess capacity, and they're one of the only ones that really have it. So it'll be interesting to see if the OPEC meeting shakes things up because sometimes that can happen. I will tell. Uh, you, one I last will tell, I, will, huh? I will tell intraday traders though on, on on the crude oil that you know on one hand you have to be careful but on the other hand if you've been watching a crude oil on a, during the day um, we it's been pretty consistent uh, when it takes a, a direction you can see some of these bars uh, opening at the high and closing at the low uh, without and if you look at the uh, 240 and 60 there wasn't much response in between that, that would trap you so uh, it's been a very good market to, to trade for intraday traders too I just want to make a note of that. Yeah, I mean, if you can find a consistent market on any uh, game of chance or any risk investment, that's a very big bonus because, uh, you know, if something is consistently bad or consistently good, or if a chart formation consistently kind of plays out, you can't really ask for more than that because that's a very big advantage if you can find that environment. Mm -hmm. uh, one last thing, quickly, grain. Uh, we got corn, uh, soybeans, and wheat to name three. Uh, and of course, uh, uh, Jake has been kind of uh, fond of the bean oil. Um, what are you thinking here? I mean, it seems like, uh, you know, it's kind of dependent on a China deal and some buying because uh, the farmers don't seem to be taking this money that the government gives them and doing anything but paying debt down and, and keeping money in reserve for a rainy day. They're not buying plant and equipment because John Deere is telling you that. So the bottom line is, is uh, we've come right back down into the 868 area on soybeans. What, what, what are you, what's your feeling on these grains? Yeah, this, we're, we're at a critical point here. I mean, we've had eight red bars, eight days in a trading days in a row where the market closed below the open. And if you go 
back further, um, you're, you're still seeing a, a, a majority of red bars uh, from the recent top, uh, th which is not odd for, uh, for for the beans. They can they can be very uh, very uh, trendy. Uh, but we're now hitting an area just about five cents from here that we need to hold at uh, eight eight sixty four area okay. uh, in the January beans. If if we can hold that, I think we could see a rally. We all way oversold already in the, on the daily chart on a short term uh, basis. Yeah, on a short term basis. So you got to watch for a pop, making you believe that you've got to change of direction again because uh, because we tend to get a series of, um, of of red or a series of green bars. Sometimes with the beans, it's best to wait um, or, or at least go very lightly early in in, in a reversal stage. But uh, that said. It usually happens not in an abrupt turnaround, but in um, in in a in a tail type of a, a way where you see a lot of shooting stars near a top or a lot of um, hammers at the bottom for you uh, fans. So it doesn't always happen, but I, I think don't be caught in in um, you know believing you have a move until you see confirmation either through another again. Um, you want to see two or three indicators here. I mean, we're already oversold. You want to look at the, the pop up, but we need to break at least the eight bar exponential moving average, and then maybe even the twenty to uh, to be even safer to um, uh, you know to, to see a move up. But I, I think it's all treacherous with the um, uh, you know I I subscribe to a woman. I gave you a name on the last show. I'm, I'm not in a position to look it up right now. A woman who's uh, was a reporter for the main English newspaper in China, and um, you know they're not so uh, positive about much coming uh, as far as uh, yeah. the trade talks are concerned. So they want the I, tariffs to be rolled back. And if he does that, that's a white flag. And that's probably not going to happen. And those guys look pretty stubborn over there. So it'd be kind of interesting to see what happens. But uh, right now we're at the top of the hour, Norm. And I want you to, again, uh, be able to reintroduce yourself to newcomers and also make sure you know uh, let people know how they can get a hold of you and try to increase their ability to trade well by getting their head together. Yeah, you know, I want, we just, we're about to start a, a new program, uh, and I won't spend any more than a, a minute or two telling you, uh, because those on this, this, you know, we have a light crowd because this is a holiday crowd, really. I'm, I'm sure we have a lot. I don't see how many people are on this call, but I know it's a light crowd, so I want to start with a, a, a light crowd. We've been doing this in a way now for um, for the last year privately with traders that have been with us for a while, but we're starting something called laser coaching, which is uh, which are 15, we're, we're going to offer traders unlimited number of coaches coaching sessions. You choose. If you want to co get coached, let, put it on the calendar and we'll be there. 15-minute coaching sessions, unlimited for a year. Uh, and that is an extraordinary offer, but I think it's going to be worth it, not only for you, but for us. I think we're going to, be, because we want to we want to change people's behavior. And, right. you know, we offer something that I that is mostly a do-it-yourself uh, at the Discipline Trader, which is uh, we give you all the mental trainings and all the things. But I, I got to tell you, the majority of people uh, have it, but it's like a gym member. If you find yourself, if you have a gym membership and you're going to the gym every day or a few times a week and you're taking advantage of that membership, you may not need or you may not want personalized coaching. But if you want, if you take a, if you want a one-on-one -on -one with Tisha and I, it's actually two-on-one, -on -one, our mental trainer where we can make specific mental training specifically for you. I mean, she uses all the, all the modern techniques. If you're interested in this, just email me. You can email me at admin, it's short for administration, admin at the disciplinedtrader.com. Okay. Admin at the disciplinedtrader.com. Say, tell me more about the laser coaching. Unlimited number of sessions. The, the, the hook is that that you can have as many sessions as you want, but if we ask you to take a mental training uh, a, a few times before to solve a particular problem, uh, then we want you to do that before you ask for another training. But if you if you're into it and you and you follow direction, this is a program you will not find. I mean, let alone people who care about the mental and emotional issues. Everybody's pointing at the, the great markets and the and the and the, and the, and the holy grail it's all you got it you can do this you just have to keep your head together and with unlimited number of coachings for a year i think you'd be interested we're doing it at a very crazy price too so if you're interested and you want to learn more about it before we actually expose it to the public uh admin at the discipline trader.com and i'll respond to it and give you the details no no hard selling on this i'm not hard selling this because this is it takes a lot of our time and we can't do it for more than say 20 30 people in a year but it's uh, and it's 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 not even a thousand dollars so I'll, I'll give you the price right there that's how crazy it is uh for unlimited coaching for a year anyway that's what we're doing we're excited about it for 
the new year. And, and uh, so I appreciate being on, Jim. And I, I uh, you know, I actually heard more from you than you usually tell. And I, I, I didn't mean to pump you on the options, but you're the one of the smartest option guys I know. So I'm sorry about yeah, that. That's uh, something that I've done for a very long time. Um, again, uh, check out what Norm's talking about. Do get in contact with him and uh, see exactly how the coaching could help you and overcome some of these things that might be hurting you as far as your behavior and uh, and the mental approach to the thing, which uh, anybody who's traded for any length of time knows is a big, big factor. Um, uh, for those who'd like to get my weekly update on what I'm seeing in all the markets or have any questions for me at all, just shoot me an email at optionprofessor at gmail.com. Be more than happy to communicate with you. Right Right now, I'm going to turn it over to David, and uh, thank you, everybody, uh, for coming today. Norm, of course, and uh, David, back to you. All right. Thanks, guys. Great discussion. So uh, just a quick reminder for everyone, be sure to uh, subscribe to Timing Research on YouTube and your favorite podcast directory. And you can also go to timingresearch.com to, uh, to get access to the report or the archive of this show when, as soon as it's available. Uh, you can also be sure to check out uh, last Monday, uh, Anka Metcalf and I hosted a, a series of lectures uh, about the uh, on the topic of Black Friday and Cyber Monday trading strategies. So since it's Cyber Monday. Be sure to check out some of those. And of course, a lot of that info is still uh, relevant uh, even beyond today. But if you just scroll down, uh, if you go to timingresearch.com and scroll down on the right side of your screen, you'll see a recent posts uh, box there. And you can just click on Synergy Traders number seven. Um, and uh, be sure to join us tomorrow for Analyze Your Trade number 104. Uh, that'll be at 4 p.m. Eastern time. Uh, Harry Boxer will be back and uh, Jim will be here to moderate. And you can go to timingresearch.com slash live to, to get access to that event. So I just want to thank my guests again for today. Uh, Neil Batho was supposed to be here, but uh, wasn't able to make it, so we'll have him back soon. Also, uh, Norman Hallett of the disciplinetrader.com and Jim Kenny of optionprofessor.com. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, David. Thank you, David.